Jesus, hold my hand. When I wander through the valley, dim toward the setting of the sun, lead me safely to a land of rest, if I am proud of Something that you often hear church leaders and others speak about is vision. We, we talk about having a vision from God, and, and we quote that verse that says, without vision, that the people perish, and we draft mission statements. But if, if, we want, if we're going to have a vision, we, we want to make sure that that vision does come from God, and that starts with, with knowing God, knowing God's nature, knowing God's characteristics. And, and that's the direction that, that we're going tonight as, as we continue uh, this series looking at at a number of the proverbs, you know, in marriages, you you eventually get to the point where you could almost finish one another's sentences. Michelle and I have been married over twenty five years now, and, and I'm not sure at what point that occurred. But perhaps it was just gradual, but but eventually we we got to that point. We've gotten to know the the heart uh, of one another. Uh, Michelle knows what those things that that make me tick. I, I know what her heart is too. And there was a time when I didn't. There was a time when she could still say things that would surprise me. And I wouldn't always communicate in, in a language that she could receive the, the message. And there were misunderstandings sometimes in those early years of, of marriage. Perhaps you could relate to that. But when you really know someone, you get to the point that, that you know what makes them tick. You, you know what their thoughts are before they even speak those thoughts. And a big part of, of Christian living is getting to know the, the heart of God so that we can share the heart of God. Uh, we study the Word of God. We study the Bible so that we could get to know God's heart. And so what do we learn it specifically from the book of, of Proverbs? Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We've talked about this previously. And the knowledge of the Holy One is, is understanding. Here, here's a quote from A.W. Tozier. It is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right while our ideal or our idea of God is erroneous and inadequate. Now listen to what he's saying. He's saying, if I don't properly understand God, I can't really live my life in conformity to his purposes. Just to give you a couple of examples. Uh, suppose that you have an image of God, that, that God is a benevolent grandfather, that he always says yes to all of our requests. He's at our beck and call. If that's your understanding of who God is, your Christianity is going to be man-centered rather than God-centered. And you're going to have a difficulty not blaming God or becoming disillusioned when things don't go just the way that you think that they should go. Or suppose that you have a different view of God. Suppose that you view God as, a, as an inflexible taskmaster. Well, in that case, your, your faith is going to be very driven by your fear. Uh, you're going to find yourself doing what the unfaithful servant did in the parable of the talents. He, he went and he buried his talent in the ground. He was so afraid to take any risk. And, and so our view of God very much influences our practices and our attitudes, for, for better or for worse. And, and that's why it's so important that we have a full and complete picture of who God is. And, and that's revealed throughout the Bible, not just in the book of Proverbs. But I do believe that, that Proverbs has some things to, to add to that discussion. God is a holy God. The verse that we had on screen a moment ago, chapter 9, verse 10, refers to God as the Holy One. Now, here's another uh, proverb that references God that way. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. And that word holy means utterly different, holy other. In other words, God is one who has no equal, no comparison. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. 
we have some dark corners in our hearts. Uh, it doesn't matter how morally upstanding you are or how good a person you are. You, you have faults. I, I have faults. There, there are things that, that we do and mistakes that we make, and there are things in our lives that, that we're ashamed of, but, but yet there are no dark corners. There are no weaknesses with God. Because God is holy, God hates sin. The Bible says there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that uh, that are swift to shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among his brothers. Now, those are things that, that specifically we're told God hates, but, but it applies to any and every sin. Now, some people are... Some people so object to God's judgment of sin, but when you think about it, the, the severity of any sin or crime is often measured by the one against whom it's committed. And so think about it this way. So suppose there's a middle school student who punches another student on the playground or in class. Well, what happens to him? Well, probably the best case is that the offender gets detention. Well, suppose he goes to detention, and while he's in the detention room, he punches a teacher. Well, basically, it's the same action, but it's committed against someone who has more authority, and so the punishment is going to be more severe. Now it's probably not detention. Now it's a suspension. Well, let's suppose that while he's suspended from school, a police officer suspects truancy, and, and the student punches that officer. Well, now he might find himself in juvie. See, crimes are, are measured by, against, uh, by the one against whom they are committed, and, and that's why sin is so difficult devastating because every sin that we commit is an offense against the holy holiness and holy nature of God. Now fortunately the good news of the gospel is that through Jesus we can be made holy and we can be in fellowship with God. 2 Timothy 1 9 says that that God saved us and called us to a holy life. But we still have to recognize this this fundamental characteristic of God. God is, is holy. And closely related to that is the fact that God is a sovereign God. What does the word sovereign mean? Now, sometimes we hear that term outside of the Bible. Have you, have you ever heard a country referred to as a sovereign nation? Now, what we're saying is they're not a colony. They're not a faction. They, they don't belong to anyone else. Uh, and sovereignty just means this. God doesn't answer to anyone outside himself. There is no higher authority. Proverbs 16.4 says it this way. The Lord works out everything for his own ends. Proverbs 19. Many are the plans in a man's heart but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. When my kids were younger and, and uh, fought <laughs> more than they do now, there was a phrase that I would often hear coming from their, the other room when they were arguing with one another. Uh, one child would say to the other, you're not the boss of me. Uh, we hear children say that, you're not the boss of me. Well, they're rebelling against the fact that one of their peers, one of their siblings, is trying to exercise authority when they see themselves as, as equals. And sometimes we struggle to accept that, that God is the boss of us, that, that there are, because there are things that he desires for us to do and to sacrifice. Here's a great quote from Charles Spurgeon. No doctrine in the whole word of God has more excited the hatred of mankind than the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God. The fact that the Lord reigneth is indisputable, and it is this fact that arouses the utmost opposition of the unrenewed human heart. You see, even to God, we want to, to say, you're not the boss of me. Sovereignty doesn't mean that our human will or responsibilities are, are taken away. I, I think Proverbs also addresses that. Several verses from the 16th chapter underscore this. Proverbs 16.1 to man belong the plans of the heart. We make our plans. But from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. Uh, Proverbs 16, 9, In the heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Proverbs 16, 33, uh, The lot is cast into the lap, but it is, but its every decision is from the Lord. And so uh, God expects us to, to study and weigh possibilities and, and make decisions, but not to lean fully on our own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And so God's sovereignty ought to be one of the greatest motivations for Christian life and service because we know that, that God is on his throne and God is controlling all things. And his purposes are going to be filled. We, we just fulfilled. We just want to make sure that we're on the right side, which is his side. 
And then the Proverbs also point to a, a compassionate God. Uh, he's compassionate in the way that he protects us. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And, and just think about those two images. Sometimes problems overtake and overrun our lives. And these are the times where we need a shield because Satan is throwing his darts and shooting his arrows our, our way, and, and we're just getting shot at from all sides, and, and we need a shield. Sometimes we feel like we need a strong tower. We need a refuge. We're too vulnerable, too exposed. And the message of Proverbs is that, uh, is that God has compassion for you those occasions. And we also see something in the Proverbs about the compassion God has for the poor, for the helpless and the needy. And Proverbs 14, 31 says, He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. You might remember we used that one uh, last Sunday morning when we talked about kindness in our Love Verse series. Proverbs 22, 2 says, Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Proverbs 15, 25 says, The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of his widow. Now, I saw something interesting recently. It was an opinion from an English professor who was an stu avid student of medi medieval literature. And he had this opinion that, that the veneration of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus in Catholicism and in the Catholic Church, stems from a misunderstanding about the nature of God. And for centuries, there existed a, a lopsided picture of God that they he was just too uh, strict uh, for anyone to endure. And so they needed Mary as an avenue to express some of these traits of compassion and acceptance and nurturing that they thought were absent from the heart of God. And I find that interesting because remember what we said from the beginning. If we fail to understand God properly, it's going to lead to some erroneous views and perhaps even some ungodly behaviors. And so we need to understand that the compassion of God, that, that's part of who he is. We, we don't need someone else for that. We don't need to fill that void. God himself is, is a compassionate God. And then finally, Proverbs shows us a picture of a wise God. No one has to teach God anything. Proverbs 3, 19 and 20, By wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge the deeps are divided and the clouds let drop the dew. When an astronomer is watching a comet through a telescope or a biologist is peering at a, at a cell through a microscope, they are both discovering God's wisdom. Now, they might be too biased to recognize it as such. But we use the term universe, and that word universe implies that everything around us is, is one, that there's a unity to it. Now, if that's the case, where, where did that unity come from? There's a song in our hymnals, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Isaac Watts wrote the words of that song. I sing the wisdom that ordained, the sun to rule by day, the, month, the moon that shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. See, he recognized that, that what God has created displays his wisdom. God's wisdom is evident in other ways, too, just the way that he orders the events of our life. Proverbs 21, verse 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that could succeed against the Lord. And you can think about this as, as well, the fact that we even have the, the book of Proverbs in our Bibles that we've been studying these last several months on, on Sunday nights it is evidence that God wants to share his wisdom with us. He wants to pass it along for our well-being and for our benefit. Proverbs 2, 6 and 7, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. And so the question to, tonight is, do you know God and have you made God's wisdom a part of your life? Because if he's not directing your steps, the destination you seek isn't going to be the destination that, that you find. Why not resolve to, to know him in, in his fullness? And that includes his, his sovereignty, his holiness, his compassion, and his wisdom. Say to those who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. The Lord your God is strong with his mighty arms when you call on his name. He will come and say, He will come and say, He will come and say. Oh,